Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Venita D'Souza, representing the communications team at Drip Capital, and I'll also be the host for today's webinar. We extend a warm welcome to all of you joining us on this, for this informative session. The focus on today's discussion is Foreign Trade Policy 2023. We are privileged to have Mr. Mihir Shah as our esteemed speaker. Thank you, sir, for joining us. We really appreciate your presence. Before we proceed any further, allow me to provide you a brief, introdu brief introduction to Drip Capital. We are a global trade finance company that specializes in offering post shipping collateral, collateral fee financing to MSME exporters in India. With a wide network of over 6,000 buyers and sellers spanning across 100 plus countries, Drip Capital has facilitated trade worth 4 plus billion across since, since our birth. We have been if you are interested in learning more about Drip Capital and would like to receive a call back from our team, kindly fill out the form shared in the chat section at this moment. A quick note to all our Zoom audiences. Throughout the webinar, we kindly request you to jot down your questions. To our, towards the end of Mr. Shah's presentation, you will have the opportunity to raise your hand and directly ask him the questions. For our YouTube viewers, please feel free to post your queries in the comment section. We'll pick it up and share it with them. Without any further delay, let's dive into today's session. A few weeks ago, the government introduced a new foreign trade policy aimed at assisting Indian exporters in navigating the challenges of international market. Today, we are fortunate to have Mr. Mihisha with us, who will help us decode with this much awaited policy. Mr. Mihir Ajit Shah holds an MBA and an LLB. He offers consultancy and advisory services related to foreign trade policy, GST, FEMA, RBI, customs, excise, and other allied subjects pertaining to import and export businesses. Additionally, he provides training in the field of international business, covering various topics ranging from the fundamental setup to marketing, government incentives, international trade agreements, and GST for foreign trade. Furthermore, he is also a registered trainer in India for ICC Inco Terms 2020. Now, I invite Mr. Shah to address our viewers. Over to you, sir. Well, good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you, Anita. Thank you, Drip Capital, Rashmi and team. It's always a pleasure to come back and, um, you know, be connected with participants and customers and prospective exporters through Drip Capital. Uh, the occasion this time is much more unique and different the one which we are all as an exporters waiting for, for probably about at least, if not less, but at least few months and maybe a year plus, that the new foreign trade policy is unveiled. And we have as an exporter or as an ex international business player from India, we have certain roadmap to follow as we go into the post-COVID situations. Friends, it's great that we have the new foreign trade policy and a lot of changes, a lot of updates, a lot of new scenarios have been discussed. More importantly, a lot of old details, old schemes have been consolidated with good tech and ease of doing business. So let me quickly take you through the foreign trade policy of 2023 and deeply discuss what do we have in store in this foreign trade policy for each one of you. As requested by Vanita, you can leave your queries and questions in the chat and I will take it up at the end of the session. Quick confirmation, Vanita or uh, Rashmi can just confirm. My screen is visible to everyone. Yes, Mr. Shah. Perfect. Yeah. Great. So the wait was over on 31st of March itself. In fact, it was morning 10 a.m. when the minister unveiled the new foreign trade policy. I think one of its kind of document this year where it was very well presented, articulated. Also, when you run through these documents of FTP, it is very, very simple and lucidly languaged document rather than making it 
sound very technical and making it very difficult for an exporter and an entrepreneur to understand. But please understand, it is effective of 1st of April of 2023. So as per the law, the 1st April 2023 onwards, all your exports, all your imports, the entire foreign trade will be governed through the FTP of 2023. Now, if you are few who have had experience in international business for at least some time, maybe at least about a decade or so, it will be sounding you slightly different because we are talking about FTP of 2023 and you know we don't say something end of it. We just say FTP of 2023. And this is because for years and years, for always I believe, we always had a policy which had a start date and an end date, typically a five-year period. So we had a policy which was 1520 policy, starting from 15, ending on 20, FY 2020. Prior to that, we have 914, maybe even 49. So we have always had a policy which would have a starting date and an end date, typically a five-year term, maybe extended. But this is the first time ever that the FTP is announced without an end date. And I remember categorically at the inaugural session, it was mentioned and it was announced that the reason is very simple, that the government wants to keep it dynamic. And as and when, if the change is required based on the exporters and the stakeholders consultation, FTP of 2023, 2023 could be and can be updated, modified, and we do not need to wait for the term to end. So it is not ending in one year, three years, five years period. It is a perpetual policy and it can be ended, amended, modified, corrected at any given point of time. So very drastic change that it gives you a continuity a long-term vision, but at the same time, it is open to recalibrate, open to modify, open to adapt to changes. So that's FTP of 2023 to begin with. Our previous policy, which is the F5 or FTP of 2015 to 20, which was extended due to COVID and further extended due to the global circumstances in UK, I mean, in Russia and Ukraine, was FTP of 1520, which expired originally on 31st of March 2020, then further extended until the FTP of 2023 is announced. That is from until 31st of March 23. Typically had nine chapters. So we had nine chapters. This new FTP 2023 has been recalibrated with 11 chapters. We have in a way, three new I, topics to discuss or three new chapters. Chapter number three, which used to be more of promotional schemes in form of, if I had to start old, old days, the focus product and the focus market, then the current one, the MEIS and the SEIS, has now changed to a very interesting aspect, which the government has already taken up but now it gets a mention in the FTP as well, is the Developing District as Export Hubs, the DEH, which also links the ODOP program. So chapter three now talks about district as export hubs and not the promotional scheme, which are though they are no more there. We've also added two new aspects in the foreign trade policy. One in terms of the e-commerce exports in form of digital economy at chapter nine. The products which have got dual uses and the export of those are to be monitored through Comet regulations has come under chapter 10 in this policy. And so the definitions which were originally at nine would have to move down to 11. So the FTP of 2023 currently holds 11 chapters. Some of these chapters are the same, but the nitty gritties and the clarifications, the issues which have been supported with the current context in these 
existing chapters are also worthwhile to look into. So let's look at the first chapter, the legal framework. Obviously, the foreign trade policy gets its uh, powers or it gets it notified through the Foreign Trade Development and Regulation Act. So understand there is a legal backing to this. In this legal framework, a new National Committee on Trade Facilitation, which is in line with the WTO commitment, is to be constituted. And this NCTF will focus on having an interministerial body, which will have basically transparency in the efficiency of the exports and imports. Use of technology, which we are already seeing, and I think I will discuss part of it when we go ahead in the discussion. Simplification of process. And for people who are already into exports, you would have seen that with use of technology that how simple things have become and how easier it is happening rather than having all the applications compulsorily examined a risk-based assessment system will be developed and finally infrastructure augmentation in terms of rail infrastructure road infrastructure airports ports icd and that will be taken with the support of all stakeholders including the state authorities so that's the whole idea under the NCTA, which is going to be formed, which has been part of the even the WTO commitment and the government will or the policy will look into that. From the previous policy, you would have heard that there is a drastic change in the approach of how the department looks at exporters. And that is one of the way it looks at or one of the way it has been, you know, messaged out or reached out to people, especially exporters, is through a program called Niryat Bandhu. Typically, the translation should be friend of exporter. But Niryat Bandhu scheme is basically meant or was is done with an agenda that the department would be handholding exporters and helping them and supporting the exporters and the importers, the entrepreneurs to grow their businesses. Now, this is fantastic from the per perspective that the department who creates the policy, the department who is monitoring the policy is going to help you and assist you. And it's been there. Amples of programs, amples of training, a lot of handholding, a lot of uh, q &A and sessions, the open house sessions have been had under the Niryat Bandhu scheme by the DGFT at across the country. Now under the foreign trade policy, not only these counseling and training and outreach programs, but the initiatives under the district as export hubs will also be part of the Niryat Bandhu. And to help you do that, the Niryat Bandhu DGFT will take support from the industry partners, the knowledge partners, and create an entire system where the district product at the district level which is identified under the DEH scheme is exported to the global market. So now Niryat Bandhu also has a so-called an agenda or a, a roadmap where product from the district level have been identified in the ecosystem which reaches the world. So that's going to be more effective from the department side under the Niryat Bandhu scheme. We've talked about the online initiatives. Let me reiterate some of them for your reference. So for last couple of years now, we have all been using the new DGTFT portal, the online portal, which is the single window system. It's on the website address called dgft.gov.in. You have a fantastic dashboard. You have all the details available. So that's going to be your central place for all your foreign trade policy related stuff with the DGFT and the Ministry of Commerce. In last one year, you would have noticed that many of these services which are available on DGFT have completely gone online. End to end have become online and more and more it will get online. In fact, it will more and more become automated. I don't know, but I was just taking one physical session in indoor a couple of days back and we were discussing something in terms of how what level of digitization has the department gone into. Let me tell you and compliment the department 
I'm sure many of you are long time good exporters, running companies, multinational companies, and having fantastic IT infrastructure. But just to give you an understanding on how good the department has gone in terms of IT is the DGFT website, when got upgraded and now we are on that common platform, we have on the platform a chatbot. And the chatbot can answer your queries in good effective manner, which would be helping you to find out the relevant issues. So how to apply an IEC is rather than searching on Google, you could go to DGFT, click on the chatbot and ask the chatbot, probably you will be surprised, not only get the answer that this is how you have to apply, but also a link to the application form, the documentation and the process. So that kind of initiative has been taken where I'm sure many of you who are into exports and business still have a very simple website. The RCMC, that is the membership with the councils have been moved online so that it is there on the common platform. So you don't miss out on your renewals. You don't miss out on the registrations. So if you are a member with PO, EPC, Chemexcel, Capexcel, Parmexcel, APEDA, AEPC, their registration certificate, which is the RCMC, has to be done online on the DGFT platform. So it is the same common platform which you will use. The DGFT has also created the online e-portal for the COO, that is Certificate of Origin. We have two types of origin certificate. One is the preferential, which is under the FTAs. This has been compulsory 100% only and only through this online platform. And you have the non-preferential, which is which are the issuing authorities are the notified association, chamber of commerce, councils, and various organizations. The non-preferential currently stands optional. You can go to the portal or get it through their independent uh, authorities. But my suggestion will be, please use the online platform. It will be very, very useful for you and it will reduce a lot of your time and effort. The online trade dispute mechanism, which is which was you know, introduced under the previous policy, that is the quality control and trade disputes, now has a complete online facility. That means your application of trade dispute is to be filed online. The documentation is to be submitted online. An entire procedure, process and procedure is to be done completely online. And finally, we have a 24 by 7 help desk where you have a toll-free number, you have an email ID, and not only that, you have an online ticket system where you could raise a query related to your export, import, and issues with DGFT, and there will be somebody to answer you. So these kind of digital initiatives have been taken and have been functioning. I am not saying this only because it's there on the slide, but each of these facilities have been used, tested by the exporters, and trust me, people are taking benefit of it. It makes a lot of difference when things are easily available online. It does reduce time. It does reduce uh, efforts by the exporter. And yes, that will help you grow your international business. Apart from this, when we talk about e-commerce and ease of doing business, to be precise, there is a situation where you want a lot of things to be automated. So basic information like your IEC profile, the importer exporter profile is completely online once you have updated you don't need to submit i remember the days where applications were made and at least about five to seven documents like your ic copy your rcmc your manufacturing license your fda license your partner's details all of these had to be again and again and again repetitively submitted to the department now the profile is online, the application filing system is online. In fact, it's not understand the difference because there were online systems earlier. The procedure now is you apply online, the department processes it online and the issuance of these certificates, authorization, licenses, permissions is also online. So we are talking about end-to-end -end online and not just using computers to you know data record it. No, it is completely procedurally online which means or which helps you to track the application, which helps you 
that in case if there is a query, I have seen n number of times where earlier the application used to be submitted to the department, department would have raised some query, the, the exporter would have got it after three, four, five days, then they would have processed it, then they would have submitted the reply back manually, and then again the process would have happened and it would have taken another time. So an application would have taken at least about 15 to 20 days. Versus today, a situation has arised that you apply today, probably the officer would have been sub processing or process the application, found some query, raised the deficiency online, you identified the deficiency, the next day itself you applied or replied to that query, and then the department can process your application, and maybe before end of the next day, your application is already processed, and the license or the certificate or the documentation is issued. The further action which I was already saying is automated or automation in the process. I'll give an example which I'm sure most of you are aware. See, the IEC or the importer exporter code is completely an online process, correct? Now, it is not only online, it is automated. So if I am a new exporter and if I wish to apply for an IEC, if I follow the steps, attach the necessary requirement, the system automatically generates and issues me an IC. There is no intervention by anybody. These similar automations through the processes have been envisaged. In fact, they have already started. I can discuss that more in detail in the other chapters, but just to give you a highlight, revalidations re of your licenses, your advanced authorizations, your EPCGs and others, which are date driven are automated, your certificates which are required maybe are, are automated. So there are so many things which, which are by policy allowed and they are simply to be monitored, automated system via dates, via the option whether it is eligible or not, are automated. So there is no manual intervention, no officer approvals. It is a system which verifies, checks, you have submitted, you are paid, and it would simply issue you the process. We are also looking at onboarding chartered accountants and chartered uh, company secretaries and cost accountants. So their certificates can be linked automatically in the system. The data, which used to take a lot of time, maybe a day, two days, three days, to be transmitted back to customs, back to banks, or from banks to DGFT, is now almost on a live method, which means as soon as the banks update the data, you get to see it here. As soon as your authorization is issued by DGFT, the customs will be able to see it. So that's the kind of a scenario which is available on that front. And finally, obviously, we also have a mobile app where you can use all of these facilities through a mobile phone. So whether you are an iOS, that is an iPhone user or an Android user, uh, you still have the facility available on your fingertips. As an exporter, uh, one of the crucial areas of <clears throat> you know, planning or working into international business is to know their exports, know their market, know the product, know their details, and for which you require to refer to certain data. Well, government understands that there is a very, very important and importance is given to the data. And macro data are very, very helpful to do certain policy decisions, especially formulate strategies, which market to go, what product to carry, how it should be done, what is the demand and supply. And for all of these, the department has in place various platforms available. So either you can log on to the Commerce Ministry's website or the Directorate General of Statistical and Intelligence, which is available, which has a link and a database which you can look into play around and understand what kind of exports is happening for your product which country which state or use another platform which is a very user inter user useful very interactive which is called neryat so neryat.gov.in is a fantastic platform it looks something like this and you'll be surprised that a lot of all of these rather has they are all you know clickable and linkable so this is a half of the screen of course you can go down and see further details but i'll give you an example what happens so when you look at niryat 
it will tell you what is the exports, how much it is, or what is the import. Now, either if you are on the world map, you select any country, and it will specifically, of course, here it is showing you the number, but it, when you click, it will further go deep drive down and tell you, okay, in, let's say, in Europe, what countries are, what is the values of exports to that country? What is the, when you go into a specific country, it will tell you the top 10, top 25 export products. If you scroll down, you will see not only the products, but which which Indian ports the goods are exported at the highest, which foreign ports the goods are offloaded the highest. So you will see the flow between the period from maybe a month on month or a year on year. So all of these trigger places or triggers are available. You can select the commodity view. You can select the map. You can select which port, which uh, sea port, which airport or which port of discharge, all of these tools can be used, obviously, and it is very certain, and I'm sure you are, you will be okay with that and happy with that. These are macro number data without any privacy data being disclosed. So no exporter, importer name, no buyer name, no information which is very consumer sensitive or commercially sensitive. Nothing of this has been discussed. Nothing of this has been made available. It is pure macro data which is good data for you to define your strategies which will help you to understand where your market is where you should do it what is the product you should go with and plan your actions for entering the international business so my request to you is have a look at this platform it's completely free you don't need to have any login access or anything the website address is called neriyat.gov.in and you could really look into and go ahead for it all right, moving further, we have under the foreign trade policy to support specific towns which are into exports or who can manufacture exports. Uh, a concept called towns of export excellence. Uh, there are certain criteria to qualify for this. Under the new foreign trade policy, the apart from the existing towns of export excellence, four more towns of export excellence have been added. So Faridabad for April, Muradabad for handicraft, Mirzapur for handmade carpets, and Varanasi for handlooms have been added. And the list of total towns of export excellence has now become 43. And all of these 43 towns of export excellence can uh, take benefit of various schemes of the government, especially in terms of getting some common facilities developed for those export specific products. So those recognized associations can come forward, take help of the uh, towns of export excellence status and develop certain common facilities in that area. This is the first time because obviously chapter three has been now modified. So we have moved the scheme or a benefit as you may call it as a, as a certification method, which is the status holder certification from chapter three to chapter one. So status holder certificate is now under chapter one of the foreign trade policy. The idea remains the same that if you regularly and substantially successfully contribute in the India's foreign trade, we will give you a status. Now the status comes based on your export performance. Mind you, the performance is required in three previous years plus the current year or two previous years as far as gems and jewelry is concerned. Now, let me give you an understanding here that previously in the previous policy, it was so current year plus previous three years when you add the export performance, that means current year is the financial year which in which you are, expo you are, you are applying, which is in this case, 23, 24 and previous three years. So previously the idea was out of current plus previous three, out of these four years, you should have exports in at least two years. But in the current FTP, as you could see, and you can read at the bottom, it says you should have export performance in all the three preceding financial year. So just merely because you have achieved the threshold performance, but if you do not have exports in, let's say, 21-22, 
then you will not be eligible because the performance of export is mandatory in the all three financial years. So I hope that it's clear that you should have export in all the three financial years. The criteria has been revised. The extreme right shows you the old one. The center one shows you the current one. So one star export house, $3 million is the same. Previously also it was $3 million. But from two, three, four, and five, we have reduced substantially. For two star, you require $15 million of exports. Three star, 50, four star, 200, and five star, 800. And mind you, this is cumulative performance of current year plus previous three years taken together. All right. Now, the double weightage on the one star continues in this foreign trade policy. Of course, it is not available for two, three, four, five. And the criteria almost remains the same. So you should, if you're an MSME, as per the MSME Act, you are having an ISO or BIS certification. You are having a unit or you are a unit in Northeastern states, Jammu and Kashmir or Leh Ladakh. Or you are an exporter of fruits and vegetables under Chapter 7 and Chapter 8. Then you are eligible for double weightage. Mind you, it is only for one star, two, three, four, and five star requires the full completion of the status and only one star can get the advantage of double weightage. The benefits continue to remain the same, but one obligation has been added in terms of status holder is that status holders are not only merely an exporter or a recognized exporter, but they are partners to the country and they are ones who are bringing good for an exchange. So not only they are bringing for action, they understand how it is to be brought in. So we want those status holders to become the skilling and mentors to the upcoming or new generation. So as far as two, three, four and five star export houses are concerned, you are required to offer training, mentorship, guidance in the domain of export and import, international business and foreign trade to number of people against each of this category. So two star five, three star 10, four star 20 and five star 50. These people have to be trained and supported in terms of the mentorship programs in the international business. More details on this are awaited. We'll have to understand because it does mention about what kind of curriculum, how many days, how it should be there, what it should be there, whether it is, you know, 50 people, meaning doing how many numbers of hours, if they do more hours, 20 people doing more hours, will it become 40? All of those nitty-gritties are all to be made available. It will be made available as and when uh, the department releases the necessary do supporting documents. But as a status holder, you have to understand that you will have to provide this skilling and mentorship programs uh, to your employees, to people to whom you are uh, getting your work done with. Finally, the validity of the certificate remains for five years. So once you get the application, once you submit the application, the five-year period will continue to, I mean, five years will be the date till for validity. Now, one notice to all the existing status holders. Please note, as per the handbook of procedure, if you are holding a status under FTP of the 1520 policy, that is the previous year policy, and let's say your validity of the certificate is till 2024 or 25. Your validity is now going to be only up to 30th of September 2023. So if you have an old certificate, which is technically valid for end of 23 or end of 24 or end of 25, will technically expire on 30th September 23 because of the condition under Handbook of Procedure Para 1.09a that all certificates issued under 1520 policy will only be valid till 30th of September 23. This may change before September, but at this point of time, I don't see it. So be prepared by September or before that to apply for your new certificate as per the new criteria to qualify and be part of the certificate accreditation. Because if you do not renew it, though technically the original certificate was valid for 20, up to 24 or 25, as per the current policy, 
the validity will be only up to 30th of September. It will not be beyond that. So that is something which you need to look into and be aware of. Let's move on to chapter two of the policy. I'm sure uh, general provisions are well, well aware of, but again, some changes, some key points is something which I wish to highlight. We're all aware of the IEC number. It's a time-digit alphanumeric number, post-GST. All of it has been clear. It is a DGFT system driven. More importantly, which I want to highlight is, I'm sure you all have all done it, but if you have not, please note that every IC holder is required to update their IC in the system in every year from April to June. If you do this, there are no charges. Even if there are no changes, you need to do it. Otherwise, your IC can get deactivated. So please understand that it is important for you to apply. One clarification has been issued for services that in case if you want incentives only, then you need to apply for IEC for exporter services. And that too, IEC should be available on the date you are rendering the service for getting the benefit. So many times what happened is I have rendered the service today. I don't have an IEC. And after six months, I go and apply. And that is the time I apply for an IEC. That should not be eligible or that will not be eligible. Be very clear that IEC should be available on the date I render the service. Benefits can be taken later on. So if as a service provider, if I ever wish to take benefits, then I should already process an IEC number. Now further, some clarifications and supporting have been issued to clarify things. Number one, uh, there have been time where export obligation under certain authorization have been expired, but you are still not completed it and you have an option to uh, get an extension, but the customs were not able to clear your cargo unless and until the extension has gone through. So now there is a mechanism where customs will allow you to clear at your risk, hoping that your things will change and you will be able to clear it. Another change which has happened in terms of imports is that if you have imported certain items, and if that item requires you with some authorization and probably an imp as an importer, you don't have that authorization, then what you can do is you can file a bond bill of entry. That is, you can warehouse the goods in a warehouse bill of entry and subsequently, after you have filed the bond bill of entry, get the goods in the bonded warehouse, apply for the authorization and then get the goods cleared later on by paying the necessary duties and taxes on the basis of the authorization then issued. So as long as you have done this process, even if you have do not have the authorization at the original point of time, you can warehouse the goods and get the authorization issued later on. So that has been clarified and that's going to be very useful for exporters, especially the ones, importers ones who do not regularly import and suddenly some item requires you to apply for some authorization or some permission. Now, this is another interesting aspect. Of course, it has been, <clears throat> it is there in the part, and I'm sure most of the newspapers, everybody has been discussing this. Uh, people have buzzed on this. So let me clarify certain points, which has been part of the FTP now. Number one, as an exporter, you should contract your invoices either in foreign currency or in INR. But please note, it is quite essential that you should get your realization in freely convertible currency. That is going to be helpful for all of us. However, in July of 22, RBI has proposed that <clears throat> INR payment can be allowed for export and import transaction subject to they are routed through a special rupee Vostro account. In fact, FTP that time also and now also has now clarified that incentives which are due to you will be eligible. So whether it is an advance authorization, EPCG, MEIS, I mean, broad tap or any of the schemes. If you have received payment in INR, but through the special rupee was to account, then those will be eligible as well for your export benefits. Mind you, 
do not get confused with rupee coming from Nepal and Bhutan. They do not come under special rupee was struck out. So we are only talking. We are only talking for rupee payment when they come through a very special created Vostro account called the special rupee Vostro account, which the foreign bank has to open with some Indian bank and the payment has to be routed through the balances of the INR through that special rupee Vostro account. So I hope that is clarified. Check with your buyer, check with your buyer's bank, check with your bank before proceeding ahead with any form of INR payment in your export transaction because INR payment in general will not be eligible unless it is coming through a special rupee Vostro account. Another clarification which is now going to help many of the exporters of the business houses is the clarification on merchanting trade. Uh, RBI master directions on imports says merchanting trade is as allowed under the foreign trade policy. In fact, previous policy did not mention it. So this policy is clarifying it. Yes, it is allowed. It is a trade where you buy from another country and you export to another country without goods actually touching India. And you are eligible to do that except for goods which are under sites and scomet. So except for sites and scomet items, all the goods can be traded. Merchanting trade is eligible and you can trade on from one country to another country. Locally or many times people generally call this as uh, drop shipment. People call it as third country transaction. Legally, it is called merchanting trade. It is eligible. Now been clarified under the FTP as well. I've already spoken about this just reiterating in the FTP that incentives which you get will be eligible um, even if you get payment in INR subject to they are under the 2.5D which is basically they are coming through under from a special rupee Vostro account. RCMC, uh, I have discussed this earlier. RCMC is now online. The question many times people ask, especially the new exporters, then why do I have to apply for an RCMC? Why do I need a membership with RCMC? Then, well, the answer is uh, if you are requiring any authorization on any benefit, any incentives under the foreign trade policy, which includes advanced authorization, EPCG, rot tap, interest equalization, any of these incentives, if you're looking at status holder certificate, all of these will be possible provided you have RCMC. So relevant councils are CMC, whether it is um, APEDA, APC, Coir Board, Spices Board, FIO, PharmaXL, whatever is your product uh, profile and accordingly you need to apply for those to that relevant council and uh, get your ERCMC now from the DGFT platform. As far as a clarification is concerned, obviously authorization uh, is to be valid at the time of export. And now uh, you can get ex extensions and EOs done at your risk, but the exports will happen and the date will be as per the license. If you're into export of pharma, uh, the track and trace system is further extended. So that's okay. We want to wait and see what happens by August or maybe near to that, we will understand what is happening on the track and trace system. Uh, I think iDawa or Dawa portal is being worked out and after that some changes have happened. So let's wait and watch. But if you're into pharma industry, the track and trace system, the QR code system for exports for the, you know, at the primary, the secondary and tertiary level, the parent-child relationship to be identified in the packaging is now been on hold till 1st of August 2023. Let me now talk about chapter three, which is the new chapter. This is the chapter which has been in sync with what government has been talking. In fact, already working on for many, many years now. Um, in fact, in last couple of years, this has been very active from on a different front, though now it is part of the FTP, but the working has already been done for long. So the idea is very simple. The idea is to bring in change, support and develop district level for the export potential. So not to talk from the top, but to go to the ground level, the district level, see the challenges, identify the products, 
identify their challenges which are there in the product exporting try and take stakeholders at the local level and improve or solve the problem and take the product to the global level so to develop that we have the district export hubs committee uh, headed by the state authorities the committee will work and design an action plan there will be state committees there will be a dgft at the helm of it and the nodal officer and all of these planning and action plan which is there will be monitored online through the dashboard the district export committee comprises of not only uh, government officials but also representative from the various associations msme chambers uh, government trade bodies quality inspection agencies state government banks so basically they are a, a whole ecosystem of export at the district level is being strengthened and the idea is very simple that we prepare a time bound action plan use all possible infrastructure tools logistics support to export those goods from that district plan the action of how to make it growing or growth of that exports and support those exporters to reach a specific targets and grow their exports from every district now if you people realize this that this is nothing but this the the call which prime minister made during his speech on 15th of august in 2019 go global one district one product district export hub was the crux of one of the point discussed during his speech on 15th of august we already have a flagship platform available and running on this which is called the exporthubs.gov.in the government is running this uh, and the, there is a monitoring of action plans from various states various district the districts have taken meetings stakeholder consultation a lot of things have happened so basically the entire country has been divided into states and then states are divided into districts and districts have let's say example here it is mumbai so district have the district committee the districts have the nodal officer from dgfp the district have the state officers district have the action plan district has the linked export promotion councils and obviously the district has the identified export products so as you can see this is an example where i have found out the mumbai as a district then you have food products gems and jewelry chemicals pharmaceuticals engineering uh services like legal transportation and management consulting so all of these are part of the district as export hub the idea to bring it into ftp is also to support the district as export hub with certain form of uh incentive probably the certain form of support through mai and through other aspects we are waiting for further details but the idea i see is very clear that now that district is export hubs is part of ftp and the action plans have already been submitted and the action plans is already in place you would certainly see changes in performance of the district as export hub scheme all right so i think we are clear with the first three chapters let's move on to the existing chapter which practically has no major change and apart from adding few supportive and i would say good progressive easy helpful ease of doing business related updates for the scheme so when we talking about chapter 4 we typically talk about three or four topics together basically we are talking about advance authorization we are talking about the dfia though duty drawback does talk about, comes under the remission scheme but it is controlled by the department of revenue indian customs so drawback is not a part of this discussion but rostel and rottep though issued and processed at the customs platform but are notified by the respective ministries the textile and the dgft and they have worked through dgft platform uh, dgft notifications the customs platform typically the ice gate is being used for them but it is notified through dgft so we need to be aware of these schemes 
Advanced authorization, I'm sure many of you are aware of. It is a scheme where your raw material, your input, which you have gets physically incorporated in the export product and you export that ex product. And because you are exporting that product, the raw material comes to you without any duty. So there is no customs duty, no additional duty, no countervailing duty, no anti-dumping duty, and no GST for advance authorization. You have two compliance under that. Number one is your value compliance. That means there should be a value addition of 15%. For some product, it is different. And then there's a quantity requirement where how much quantity will you be eligible to? So you have a standard input-output norm, which is called Scion, where a standard rates are or normal wastage have been notified. You can use that. Or you have what is called as no norms, where the exporter or the importer, the manufacturer, defines how much wastage it is, justifies it. And the norms committee headquartered DGFT Delhi will decide on this norms. The clarification or an update which has been done in the part of advanced authorization incentive thing is very clear that if you get money in INR, then make sure that it is as per the notifications of 2.52, which basically means that under 2.52 and 5.3, that export realization is through special rupee Vosto account. Clarification in terms of SEZ supply, uh, clarification in terms of document required as far as bill of export is concerned, under advanced authorization is also part of this FTP, thereby removing any ambiguity, if any. As far as no norms committee approval is concerned, the original idea was that it would be valid for three years or up to the FTP period. Now, because we don't have an end period in the FTP that goes away, so the validity is three years from the date of issue. So any norms approval which you get, the ad hoc norms which is approved for you, the validity is for three years now. And after three years, you will have to apply further. For all existing already done, if you already existingly hold an F, uh, uh, no norms, which is issued after 1-4-2015, then that will be valid up to 31st of March, 2026. So you don't need to go back to the department if it is already there. Though originally valid for three years or four years or maybe up to the FTP, it is now valid until 31st of March, 2026. This is That means it is valid for three years from today and that should be good enough for you. The validity on the authorization is 12 months, extendable once again for 12 months straight away. Now, I did mention to you about you know, uh, simplification and more importantly, automation. So one such automation process has been developed in terms of advanced authorization, where typically, if you have not completed your export obligation, you could ask for an extension. Originally, there was a charge or a compensation fee which used to be paid, but for which there has to be a calculation and how much exports you have done. And based on that, the pro rata cover king was done. This means that there had to be somebody who had to verify the data for giving you export obligation extension. See, remember, you are coming here only for an extension, right? You still have to complete your exports and then come back for closure. But just at the time of extension also, a lot of checking had to be done because the extension fees, the compensation was based on how much you've exported and how much you've not completed. To make it simple, make it easier and make it quicker, the department has done away with that and now said, if you want an export ex export obligation extension, the first extension, which is for six months, will be based on a flat fee based on a value of your license. So if your CIA value is two crores, you pay flat fee of 5,000. I'm not going into the nitty gritties of how much you have exported. Have you exported 99% or you have exported only 1%? Doesn't matter. Your export, you want to have an extension, your CIA value is two crores or less, pay 5,000 rupees. If it is between two to 10, pay 10 crores, and if it is above 10 crores, pay 15,000. Flat fee, no, nothing to be look into. We will look into how much you've exported, you have not exported, what have you done at the time when you come to the department for closure. Second extension, same way, but a little higher fees, 10, 20, 30. And if there is a PRC, that is public, uh, it's, it, that is the policy relaxation committee decisions, then you have fees are 25, 50, and 1 lakh. So the idea is very simple that these kind of extension could be done automatically because 
the values are locked in the system, the amount is paid by you as per the system, then it will automatically or it will be easily, quicker, faster, immediately without any manual intervention get extended. Uh, one word of caution in terms of compliance, you are required to submit your documents, especially the export obligation closure within six months from the last date of export. Now, if you do not complete your exports and you have to regularize it, of course, there are certain processes. So as far as when you complete your export obligation in value terms, but not in quantity terms, then you have to calculate the 10% of the CI value, which you have not exported. But if you have completed in terms of quantity, but the minimum value addition, which is 15%, that is not fulfilled. Then earlier the working was different. Now the working is that you will pay 3% of that shortfall as the composition fee. And of course, that calculation will be done on an FOB value, which is in India, INR. So based on that, let's say you are required to do exports worth 1 crore rupees as value addition, 15%. But you did only 99 lakhs. 1 lakh which you have not done, on that 1 lakh, 3% of the amount is what you're going to pay as the compensation fee for your value-wise dish or value-wise reduction or not meeting the criteria. Finally, as far as fees are concerned, this is a very good news for all of you, especially MSMEs. There's a bumper announcement for all msme see the normal fees have been 0.1 i'm sorry one rupee per thousand of the cia value maximum one lakh so this was standard for everyone until previous policy but in the current policy now if you're an msme your fees for advance authorization dfia and epcg for a value of two rupees one crore is only going to be 100 rupees and for a value more than 100 crore, the fees will be only 5,000 rupees. So as an MSME, you are going to pay maximum fees of 5,000. And everywhere else, the others are going to pay a maximum fees of 1 lakh rupees. So that's a very big change as far as the government fees is concerned, especially for a MSME. DFIA continues to remain the same. There are no changes under the scheme under DFIA. It continues to remain as it is. So we will go ahead with the discussion further the two schemes which are notified under the chapter 4 but obviously they are part of the disbursement through customs portal one is rostel which is for chapter 61 62 63 notified by our textile ministry com textile committee and textile ministry for ready made garments and made ups and the similar line scheme called rottep so remission of duties and taxes on exported product is under scheme under chapter 4 of the foreign trade policy. It continues to be there in the chapter. It continues to have everything. More importantly, you are going to refer the appendix 4R. The 4R, which is aligned as per the new HSN codes, everything updated. We have around 10,000 plus HSN codes which are covered under the RODTEP scheme. Mind you, the script which is issued through the customs platform working is done on the custom platform. The validity of the script is two years. And you're going to use that script now, obviously, just a number. It's a digital script, digital number. It is freely transferable. But everything has to be done on and with the IceGate platform. So equally that you are working with DGFT and the DGFT website, please understand you need to have your access and working with the IceGate platform. Moving further, the chapter 5 of the foreign trade policy talks about EPCG scheme. We continue to have EPCG scheme in the same manner where goods are to be exported, manufactured from that machinery. So the idea is you can bring in capital goods and you can export better quality goods, have, give better services to the exporters, uh, to the foreign buyers. So to enhance your manufacturing capabilities and capacities, we have the scheme called EPCG. The scheme gives you duty-free import of capital goods, but it gives you an obligation of six times of the duty saved in a period of six years. Now, please understand you also have to maintain an average performance when you export. So this is very sim advantage. Now, clarification has been supported in the foreign trade policy current FTP of 2023 that 
please understand if you come, you have a six years is the maximum period, of course, extendable. But originally, six years is the maximum period. But if you export, complete your export obligation in two years, then you have to maintain average only for two years. If you complete in one year, you don't, you have to maintain average only in one year. And if you do not complete the average, but you take six years, then you have to maintain average for six years. Another is that your average is over and above your, I mean, your export obligation is over and above your average. So whatever you first make average, the balance will be used for your export obligation under the scheme. That has to be very clear that it, the export obligation under EPCG is over and above your average performance, which you do. Realization, again, it has been clarified and does specifically in the chapter five that if you get money in INR allowed, but provided it comes from special rupee Vostro account only, All right? Now, as far as one of the compliance of the EPCG scheme is concerned, you require, that is a authorization holder required to report <clears throat> exports for their EPCG annually to an annual reporting method. Unfortunately, I think the, the policy also mentioned that it should be done online and we did not have any system. So most of the exporters were not re, uh, re supporting it or not submitting it. And no further actions were even taken by department because I think the system was not in place. However, in the current situation, we have the system in place and my humble request to all EPCG license holders, all those who have EPCG, please note, you are required to submit an annual report of what you have exported in the previous year under the EPCG by 30th of June every year. So we are almost entering June. My request to you is please log on to your portal, go to this platform, which is the EPCG section of the services, there's an annual reporting option available. Check out what document, what is the uh, data, data required. Mind you, they don't require physical copies. They don't require any on um, any attachments, but it do, they do require data in a specific format. Then please go and check and try and submit it before 30th of June. Because if you don't do that, then the late fee charges are 5,000 rupees per year. As part of EPCG, uh, in the previous policy, we had one scheme called post-export EPCG. I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but that scheme is deleted or it is no more available. We have removed the scheme in this new policy. So we have only one EPCG scheme, which is 0%. That means you do not pay the duty on the capital goods upfront. You export and you close your license and obligation. Chapter six talks about EOUs, EHTPs, BTPs. They continue to remain the same. It is not allowed for tradings. It is a manufacturing you set up. The requirement under the EOUs, EHTPs, BTPs still remains one crore in plant and machinery. And overall, EOUs, EPCG scheme under chapter six remains the same. And there are no changes under the new FTP of 2023. Chapter seven is deemed export. Again, no changes under the scheme because we still have the advanced authorization. We still have EPCG. So exports which are classified under deemed export at chapter seven continue as it is under the chapter seven of FTP 2023. Chapter eight, which is quality complaint and trade disputes. Very, very interesting chapter. First time introduced under the FTP of 1520. This is the... Idea was very simple that if exports have happening across the world and there are challenges, disputes, why not have some methodology where the disputes can be settled or resolved? Also, it was meant to showcase to the world that we have methods and processes to address grievances of those importers and exporters. The quality complaint and trade dispute, that is QCTD, covers three kinds of complaints. Number one, complaints from the foreign buyer for the quality of the goods which Indian exporters have supplied or services which they have supplied. Number two, complaints from the importers, that is Indian importers, for the suppliers or the goods which the foreign suppliers have sent into India and they are not as per, as per the promised contract. And third, unethical trading, 
in terms of non supply partial supply defective goods not correct good no payment non adherence of delivery schedule all of that by either the supplier or the exporter based out of india or the importer based out of overseas country so all of these three categories can be used its entire process is now completely online and let me tell you the government takes very very effective steps in trying to resolve those complaints and not only the government sitting at the headquarters in delhi at dgft but the indian high commission offices have roped in have been pulled into service for these quality and trade disputes now in the ftp of 2023 another small amendment has been added in this whereby every complaint is going to be having a case officer who will look at those complaints understand those complaints try and work on and in a timely manner resolve those complaints so earlier do complaint was happening but probably we were not aware of how the status is happening what is the indian high commission doing what is happening at the other end but now there is a case officer from the dgft who will be attached to your complaint and based on that the officer has to resolve your issue within a timely manner so that the amendment which is happening in the qctd chapter 8 of the foreign trade policy if today's world is to be considered digital e-commerce online purchase buying and selling is no more a thing of the past but the need of everybody it is something which is being done on a day to day man day to day level we are working on this on a regular manner and hence promoting digital business e-commerce business is very very essential very limited discussion have been had in the previous ftps but now i think it is high time that the department has considered and understood that e-commerce and the exports through digital economy has to be covered in detail chapter 9 has been dedicated to the e-commerce business where very clearly the objective is very defined that the current businesses of goods and services is growing the economy and e-commerce supply e-commerce channels are going to be the key aspect now apart from getting you more incentives or benefits of course that will happen in future but key element which has been done and i'm very happy to say that is going to help all of us in future and even now as the foreign trade policy is already defining it is the definition of what is e-commerce exports so now under the ftp e-commerce of goods e-commerce of services e-commerce exports basically e-commerce exports of goods e-commerce export of services has been defined and if i just want to inter, uh, you know read it for you e-commerce export of goods is basically exports of goods where selling is through internet on an e-commerce platform and the payment of which is done through international debit card credit card through or through an autom- authorized electronic payment channels as specified by rbi from time to time now the word used very interestingly is selling through internet on an e-commerce platform now people will say then what is e-commerce platform well we have the policy defining that as well and it is fantastically kept it open which says e-commerce platform is an electronic platform including a web portal that enables commercial process of buying and selling through internet now if you look at this i see it has a fantastic large scale advantage to clarify what is a platform which means it could be your website it could be your instagram page it could be your facebook page it could be your mobile app it could be your third party pl- platform like amazon and others anything which is where the goods are being sold which where commercial process of buying and selling is happening and internet is the key medium there it will be considered as e-commerce platform so i think that's going to be helping many many exporters who are wanting to export goods online we have e-commerce logistics provider also who will help you to export goods across the world through a efficient manner now that the chapter 9 has been defined i'm sure in near future we'll have more specific uh 
processes, simplification tools available to promote this digital economy. One such tool, which is there, that how much can we export through foreign post office and courier? The limit now has been enhanced to rupees 10 lakhs. This limit was less now, it has been enhanced to rupees 10 lakhs per consignment. So now, if you want to send up export or parcel through courier or to post, you need not worry because the limit under that is 10 lakh rupees. What's future for e-commerce? Well, the idea is very simple. To create more and more outreach programs through Niryat Bandhu schemes on e-commerce, probably create e-commerce export hubs so that logistics challenges which are there can be reduced. And very interestingly, create the Dakgar, that is our post offices from across the world, across the country into Niryat Kendras. So use those network and facilities of the post office Connect it via HubSpoke model to the foreign post office and use the entire service of postal department to export the goods of e-commerce, which is very small in size, small in quantity, but quickly at a low cost through these post offices. So Dagar Niryat Kendras are something envisaged to be done in a very new, new future time. Finally, we come to chapter 10 of the foreign trade policy, which is again a new chapter dedicated to special chemicals, organisms, materials, equipment, and technologies, popularly called as SCOMET. Now, what is SCOMET? Now, typically you have to understand that India would allow or would love to allow you to export anything and everything. But there are instances or there are challenges where a product which you are exporting, especially the chemicals, the materials, the equipment, and including technologies, software, can have more than one use. And when I say more than one use, what are we referring to? We are referring to either a civilian use or industrial use, but also probably able to you be used in weapons of mass destruction. So the dual use products which are there have been identified by the DGFT. We have an appendix three to identified list of it and those identified list which is the comet items have been identified if your product is under the comet items then you have to be careful because you would require a so-called noc or an authorization to export depending upon what is the end use of the product the macros comet list is divided into seven categories zero to eight one category is reserved and each of this category has an authority who will be justifying it, whether it is allowed or not. So let's say most of them is going to go to DGFT, but there are certain like product related nuclear has to get an authority letter from or NOC from Department of Atomic Energy. There are certain products specially related to items which can be used in weapons. There, the Ministry of Defense has to provide an NOC or supporting NOC to allow the exporters to export. So, of course, the nodal agency will be DGFT. The procedure of licensing will be application to DGFT, but the approving authority at the back end or the approving ministry at the back end through the interministerial committee is these uh, departments. And once their NOC is received, the exporter can export. So, be very careful when you're dealing with export of SCOMET items. Uh, go through the details and nitty gritties. Some clarification in terms of whether you export to SEZ, is it required? Well, no. Uh, when you supply to an SEZ a product which is a comet that is not required because though SEZ is deep territory outside India, it is still in the physically in India. But once SEZ wants to export out of the country, then which is physical export, then they will require the comet authorization. If you want to import products which are under comet items, then without comet, you know, imported items cannot be exported. So even if you have exp even if you have imported a product. At the time of import, it was okay, but at the time of export, if it is a product which has a dual use, it will have certainly to be used. I mean, only exported, provided there is a comet authorization available to you. Finally, we have chapter 11, which is basically the chapter 9 earlier moved to chapter 11, which takes care of the definitions, scenarios like what we discussed of e-commerce, 
a new scenario of project exports also has been defined under the foreign trade policy apart from the general definitions which are already there more importantly the chapter 11 now also clearly and that's where we want to focus again our ease of doing business as the time bound disposal of various applications and interestingly you will see there are sometimes some places where you will see like uh, issuance of advance authorization through automatic route so you remember going back to ease of doing business digital thing where you submit applications and based on auto processes the license is issued issuance of epcg through automatic re revalidations amendments all of these extensions are going to be on an automatic basis and if you see the number of days which will take now to issue these are nearly one day one working day to get your processing done so that's the idea under e-commerce and online uh, digital idea digital ease of doing business and digital implementation by the department friends that's chapter 1 to chapter 11 of the ftp of 2023 i hope that clarified you and gave you an update on what is in store in this new ftp i hope that gave you an understanding of what changes are there with a very clear birds eye view that we are looking for simplification automation ease of doing business and stricter compliance before i hand it back to vanita for further uh, procedure i want to talk on some specific point which is technically not part of ftp but very important and announcement which is part of the immediately after ftp is the amnesty scheme which is available for advance authorization and epcg holders so as you are aware that we have two schemes for years now which is advance authorization for raw material epcg for your capital goods now for whatever reason if the exporter is not able to complete the export performance technically you are supposed to pay the duty with interest and now with so many years passed by the interest would become either equal to or more than in fact the principal value of the duty now for the one time dgft has come out with the amnesty scheme please understand what is covered it is the scheme for advance authorization and epcg but only for the period of authorization issued in 914 and 49 policy please understand the chronology here we are currently in ftp of 23 previous to that the policy was 1520 this is not considered previous to 1520 the policy is 914 this is considered and previous to that the policy was 2049 this is considered so if you have old authorizations old licenses of 2049 policy for which the validity was beyond 12 8 or you have a policy which is under ftp of 914 which is issued till 31st march 15 then on that licenses if you have not completed your export obligation you can avail the amnesty scheme i hope this is clear that the criteria is done here now what does the amnesty scheme allow you if you have not completed your export completely or you have done partly and part you have not completed whatever be it you can apply for the amnesty the amnesty will allow you or the benefit of the amnesty is you will pay the entire custom duty of unfulfilled so either if you have not exported the entire amount or whatever you have uploaded up, so i mean exported proportionate balance so full duty amount has to be paid plus you will pay interest on the customs duty only that is the bcd only and that will be capped at 100% so whatever be your custom duty or payable the interest will be only on bcd and the interest will be capped at 100% there will be no interest on the additional customs duty and the special additional customs duty <clears throat> so you will not pay interest on technically what is called as the cvd and the sad you will only pay the custom duty on the bcd portion and that too it will be capped at 100% now why this is important just to give you the context the duty interest the custom duties interest was at one point of time 18% and then now at 
considering these old cases, it will be ideally at least that you will have about seven to 10 years of interest rate. So when you say 18%, even if you put it at 10 years, it is 180%. So that will be capped at 100% of the value. So if your custom duty is, let's say, 1 lakh rupees, interest will be maximum capped at 100%, which is 1 lakh. Now, if for any reason you are eligible for this, if you are working, I mean, if you, there is a scenario case, you have request is please adhere to the timeline. The timeline is that by 30th of June, that is the end of this next month, before that, you need to register your application that yes, this is my authorization, this is the thing, and I want to avail this benefit of amnesty. DGFT on their part will verify your documents details, maybe call for additional information and ultimately give you the final thing that yes, this is the amount of duty you need to pay and this is what it is under the amnesty. You have time until 30th of September, that is about three months to pay that duty plus interest and to the customs authority and come back to DGFT for the closure. If you already have any cases adjudicated and appeal is to be pending, you can do so even for amnesty. But if there are cases where you've already paid duties and interest, those cases are not to be considered. One important part you need to understand that no SENVET credit is available on these. So whatever you pay is technically a cost to you, but the amount is on a dependent. So be very clear that there are specific criteria for availing this amnesty scheme. But if you are eligible, I think it is a fair chance to regularize all those old matters and think about future and plan for your exports ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much. It was lovely to talk to you guys. I hope the time you have devoted along with me here today has been fruitful, have been with some information. Thank you so much. Vanita, over to you for question answers. Thank you, Mr. Shah. I think this is one of the very fruitful sessions and you've really cleared a lot of doubts folks might have here. Uh, but I'm sure people do have some questions. Uh, in case you've joined a bit late, uh, audiences on a Zoom can actually, you know, raise their hands or drop their questions in the Q&A section. Similarly, if you're watching us on YouTube, please write your questions in the Q&A section and we'll pick it up from there. Um, Meanwhile, I think Rashmi has already sent me some questions, Mr. Shah, so I'm going to share it with you. Sure. Uh, so Mr. Kaushal, who's watching us on YouTube, said, uh, I, I wish to start as a merchant exporter and want to deal with multiple products such as printed canvas frames, upholstery, curtain clothing, and ready-made garments. All of this product come under different categories. How do, how do I get RMC, RCMC for these different products? Please help. Okay, Mr. Kaushal, uh, when you deal with multiple product, we have a parent export promotion council called FIO, that is Federation of Indian Exporters Organization. You could register with FIO and avail the required benefits. However, just for reference, at some point of time, if you want to register with any specific export promotion councils, you have advantage or you have a choice to even register with multiple councils. So as far as to begin with, for a multi-product, register with FIO and maybe at some point of time you realize that okay my product uh, I'm specializing in one of two of the products and I need to get more specialized uh, registration then you could do it as long as you're not doing commodity products like tea coffee uh, cashew coir which is comes under the commodity boards as long as those products are not there you are okay to register with FIO if you deal or want to deal with coffee, tea or coir or maybe some specific agriculture products, then you will have to have an additional registration with those specific commodity boards and APEDA. So that's the answer to the question. I hope that helps you. Um, thank you, Mr. Shah. I think we'll take some questions from Zoom now. Yes. Uh, all right. We take a question from Ms. Kinjil Shah. Yeah. There's a huge demand for products from India, made, processed in India. But unfortunately, because of their past experiences with some other suppliers, the international buyers feel very risky in doing business with India. How strong is the government if any Indian supplier takes the advances and defaults and not sending the goods? 
how can an international buyer feel safe while doing business with indian suppliers uh well this is on the other side kinjal uh let me tell you uh everybody wants to protect brand india and i think um uh, in 2015 when this quality complaint and trade dispute mechanism came into existence the idea was this exactly that some black sheep should not spoil the entire brand of india just to give you the context that i have seen many actions being taken under the quality complaint trade dispute mechanism which can include to levy penalties heavy penalties to the ic holder which could include that the exporter be cancelled of an ic and these are all quasi judicial things so this is all under the law so it is not that oh they say and it is just you know talk of the town no it is part of the act and hence the actions can be taken so yes um, government is very very clear and very serious on exporters defaulting on their commitment but again you have to also appreciate the fact just like how uh, we have challenges with the buyer at many times buyer don't uh, commit and not uh, you know fulfill their commitment of payments delivery details all of it similarly you may have a challenge so it's a commercial business so understand at the same time it's uh, you know discipline in an international business is not the job of the government it is the job of the buyer and the seller but yes government is i think very clear that by not being disciplined not doing what you are committed to if it is spoiling the brand india it is going to take uh, things at its task so be prepared and be very clear of it the foreign buyers can file uh, the complaint to the department and department does very actively respond to it okay um i think we have the next question from mr rakesh gupta he wants to understand whether godep scheme is available from rupee export in nepal and uh, i think he has yeah. another question which is about gst refund fully or being fully automated okay so as far as rotep is concerned export to nepal it is not eligible uh, it is only eligible again let me reiterate my point sir not only rotep any of the scheme uh, is not eligible if you get money in inr unless it comes from that special rupee vostro account second uh similar scheme was available only for iran earlier that was also through a special vostro account so if you are exporting to iran and you get payment in inr that is a routed through uco bank that's a special vostro p vostro account so unless you get incent when exports realization in inr through the special rupee vostro account only then you are eligible for inr forget nepal any other country also as far as your question is concerned nepal we are very clear it is not the special rupee vostro account so you are not going to be eligible for rotep incentives through nepal uh, is gst fully automated uh, well it depends upon what kind of in, uh, which part of gst refund are you taking if you are referring to the igst refund yes it is automated if you are referring to lut refund it is partly automated but the application has to go online the application procedure is online but the department uh, which is the gst authorities will proceed process it probably ask you for additional documentation and it is i would not say manually submitted but it is manually driven but as far as the paid igst is concerned it is system driven automated completely yes okay um i will take the next question from mr ajay singh he wants to know if there is any changes in road depth rates ajay ji uh, i mean there are more than 10000 items i do not remember all of them but to my my memory shows me correct uh, there are no changes currently in rotep rate the last change in the rate came on 31st of december where for 15th uh, we had new chapters being added in the rotep basically chapter 72 uh, 72 73 and chapter 30 a uh, few hsm codes have been aligned as per the F, uh, the the finance bill so i don't know or i am not uh, i mean i would not say i don't know but i would not uh, say there are no changes currently in place as far as rot temp rates are concerned however my request would be please log on to dgft portal there is a tab called rot temp there is a list called appendix 4r 
simply log on to that PDF file, check out your eight digit, full eight digit HSN code and check the raw tip rate. So it's not me who tells you or not somebody or not Google who answers you. You go to the official reference place and use that reference for your calculation. I think that would be a best solution for your calculation for raw tip. Uh, we'll take the next question from Mr. Purva Saha. I'm going to let him speak. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Saha, can you please unmute yourself? Hello, very good evening. Very good evening, Mr. Saha. My the main concern is that there are a lot of challenges in international trade as faced by MSME and startup companies in India right now. So, do you have any mechanism uh, in your platform uh, to integrate international buyers with this SME uh, uh, on BSM basis? Uh, I mean, buyers and sellers meet and all. Could you put some light in that, actually? I believe that is question to Vanita and Rip Capital team. Um, sorry, I missed that question. Could you please repeat yourself? I think I wanted to ask that does uh, Drip Capital or a platform has a facility to link the buyer seller to the MSME so that they can, uh, you know, probably take benefit of connecting with them. That's the crux of the question. Uh, not at the moment. I'm, I'm really sorry. We don't have anything like that. But that is the call uh, for an, that is the call uh, for an hour right now. Mr. Saha, but let me just reiterate the actual job of the export promotion councils is this so i do not know which product you deal with but if you deal with uh, any of the products whether it is chemical plastics most of the councils are having these activities on a probably i would say regularly in fact every month there would be some uh, delegation some buyer seller meet something happening and that could be benefited to you so because you are into exports, you are any which way is a registered member of this council. I'm sure you would be able to take benefit of those. So, I mean, ideally, I mean, I'm open when whenever Drip Capital does whatever they need to add on this. But the requirement what you have is already being fulfilled by the export promotion councils. Do you think that export promotion councils at this point of time will really assisting their uh, authorized license IC code holders? Do you believe, truly believe in this? Certainly, sir. Very, very certainly. And there, I am, I am very clear that their role and their... I am a member of, I am a member of uh, FIO, I am a member of APEDA, AMPEDA, Correct. and all. I, am, I, I didn't get any inquiries from them, actually. Not at all a single inquiry. Uh, sir, Mr. Saha, I'm, I'll think, just one I'll answer that and then we can probably... Mr. Saha, inquiries is something I think it is very, very difficult to say. Uh, it is a, again a question no, of what you want. Very categorically that councils are assisting exporters for finding international buyers. That's right, no? Yeah, because you mentioned about buyer-seller meets. That is you what said, I am telling that councils are not responsible for all these activities. That is what I mean to say. Sir, I think uh, you you need to check on them. They do organize buyer-seller meets. They do organize delegations. They do organize exhibitions and participation. Now, oh. if you have any specific requirement, I think we need to speak on that separately. But yeah. as far as uh, their role is concerned, their role is to bring buyer and seller at one point. They will not give you the addresses and the specific details and data, but they will create a platform for you. And they are yeah. doing that. All councils are doing that. Uh, probably you need to look at that in a different manner. I'm not too sure what you require specifically, but as far as I'm concerned, what I understand is you said you wanted buyer-seller meet, you want delegations, you want support of where the buyers can be available. These platform, these organizations help you and assist you. Nobody is going to give you buyers in your email box. Thank you very much. Um, you, just to add to what Mr. Shah said, uh, even though we do not help to uh, help exporters find new buyers at drip uh, if you are an existing client at uh, and are using our services maybe when you're trying to onboard a new buyer we'll be able to help you with this 
information whether he pays you, pays you on time or he is defaulted in the past so that you feel more com comfortable uh, onboarding a new buyer however this is only limited it's a very limited service for existing clients who use our platform anyway thank you for your assistance thank you all right uh i think we can take the next question this is from mr pradeep gulaskar he wants to know does eodc in case of aa is required for norms to be fixed yes sir mr pradeep uh your eodc is required for all whether it is fixed norms which are fixed that is under scion or under adoc you will have to apply for your eodc post you have completed your exports uh mr ankit mishra wants to know if a uh, advance authorization slash epcg application and eu extension fee structure is updated in the new ftp 2023 i believe what you are referring is to the msme fees yes it is updated so the new application fees if you are an msme gets reduced as i said um, minimum of 100 rupees maximum of 5000 as per your cif value and if you are a uh extension fees uh, is already updated yes uh it is updated and you can take benefit of that there is no problem uh the next question is by mr thaneshwar jangir whether scz units will be incentivized with rodept also another question whether good ship shipped via csb5 shipping bill is required to required to be gr cleared brc clearance if amount is received via paypal for e-commerce exports uh mr uh, jangard uh, if i pronounce it correctly mr thaneshwar so well as far as uh, scz is concerned uh under rottep we have a entire list of ineligible criteria and unfortunately goods manufactured and exported by scz fall under this an ineligible criteria so as far as scz is concerned rottep is not available for them it is uh, certainly one of the demands of the scz's exporter and i'm sure many export promotion councils have taken it to the respective authority but at this point of time it doesn't it's not an eligible situation okay. as far as your other question is concerned of csb5 uh, yes you still require to close your export transaction because the moment you file your csb5 it will impact or it will be reflected in your uh, edpms and uh, once the payment comes via paypal or to any online channel it has to be closed brc has to be issued i do know there are some uh, cost challenges because every brc the bank will charge you certain amount and but yes answer your question is you will have to get your gr or your shipping bill closed edpms is settled uh next question is from mr deepak dave uh transactions between dta and scz unit need to go through imports exports uh import exports boe idpms and edpms there is a bill of lading why to pay bank charges for both import and export legs i am not too sure of why would they, how can there will be a bl there is no bl in case of dta to scz uh another thing i don't know uh, so so you have to understand so what you are referring to is uh, idpms and edpms on both side but you have to understand idpms and edpms or export and import uh, uh, you are talking but you are talking from two different sides and in this case probably you know both the sides see even when you do an international export when you sell to a foreign buyer and let's say when you receive remittance you pay some bank charges the foreign buyer also has his own site of charges right so in in a in a normal export transaction also there are bank charges on two sides just in this case because you probably know the dta you know the scz and you are the dta or the dta and the scz both happen to be in a indian setup you feel that there are two time charges but please understand when your dta sells to an scz it is one side and scz is importing or buying it into it there's a different side so if the banks are leaving charges that is completely uh, you know banks provocative or banks transaction based yes you may certainly if there is a same bank if it is within your uh, you know scope you may ask for a waiver of charges it's a pure commercial understanding i don't think that's a problem 
it could be discussed with the banks and probably banks could extend some benefit to you okay uh the next question is mr from mr rajesh kumar mehta like drawback allows it for short short payment for short payments up to 12.5% is there a similar provision for rodep scheme too so mehta it is not so yeah you are right 12.5% has been discussed and in the drawback scenario but not there is no specific mention for that in the rodep so uh, i would at this point of time say no um not not pos not available as far as uh, rot tap is concerned uh mr naresh is needs help to interpret 5 para 5.09 which is incentive for early eo, EO fulfillment under yeah. epcg can you please help him uh mr naresh we can help you out but my i mean you can i mean there are you can connect with the coordinates available with uh, drip capital but what i understand is you are referring to situation where you have completed your export obligation uh, the concept is very simple uh, let's say you had to do 100 rupees of your exports to qualify or complete your 6 uh, times of the duty saved the period under epcg is 6 years so in 3 years or in less than 3 years if you do 75% of what was allowed what was eligible then 25% is waived off that's the incentive which is available under 5.9 which is called the quick exporter incentive or incentive that are for a fast track uh, if you still have further information maybe <coughs> my connects are there please feel free to write me an email give a reference of drip capital webinar and i'll be happy to assist you uh, i think we'll take the last question from for today it's from ms sujata sarkar does brokerage and commissioning in agro commodities as an indian company for third country exporters and importers qualify qualifies for incentives uh sujata ji uh, when you say third country export i believe you are referring to merchanting trade so be very clear that when you do a merchanting trade that means you buy from an x country sell to a y country you make money obviously you do because you buy at 100 you sell at 110 uh that 10 rupees is your gain there cannot be any incentive or benefit because that's it's a it's a commercial business commercial gain and there is no uh, export of goods or services so there is no incentive on merchanting trade activity you may you may you may probably even do it at 100 100% margin i mean you buy it 100 and sell it 200 i don't mind but there is no incentive for that uh, but yes you are legally allowed to do it merchanting trade is legally allowed there is no problem now ftp has also clarified that it is allowed so you should go ahead and do if you have opportunity at that point i think this is the last questions that probably we could take in case if you have any more doubts uh mr shah had already mentioned his coordinates you could reach out to him directly one on one and probably speak to him and get more clarity on your subject matter uh with this we come to an end for today's session thank you mr shah once again for being a part of drip capital's webinar and for sharing your knowledge with our fellow exporters thank you for all our viewers for joining and being excellent audience members in today's webinar you will receive a short survey once we end the session request you all to share your valuable feedback and topics you want to talk talk you want us to talk more about uh we also have an announcement if you are an exporter based out of pune in maharashtra drip capital in association with cr forex is hosting an event on how to simplify export finance and minimize forex forex cost on 2nd of june at 7 pm at hotel crown plaza we cordially invite you to attend this event you may register using the link provided in the chat section this event will help you learn more about drip's product and how factoring can help you expand your business so pune folks we expect you all to meet us at the event all the details are given in the registration link in the chat section uh, in case if you missed that you can always reach out to us directly and we'll be happy to register you please follow us on social media to stay in touch with drip capital you can also follow our blogs and newsletter for recent trade updates and insight on foreign trade related matters subscribe to our youtube channel you may click on the link shared in the chat section you can watch all our previous webinars including the one given by mr shah on our youtube channel With that we conclude today's session once again thank you and ha and have a great evening everyone thank you thank you so much bye bye thank you mr shah